Good morning, it's Sunday and it's Mike with your bulletin announcements and I'm excited to be here. Just to let you know, we have that touchless service. As always, if you'd like to get your prayer request out, just go to compres.com backslash connection cards. And as you can see on our stage right now, it is a special Sunday. Today is the children's Sabbath and we have the Compress Youth Band on the stage ready to rock it out. Let's hear them make some noise for them out there. That's right. The youth are taking over and no better day than today. So welcome our youth. It's our children's Sabbath kicking off today. Um, the pumpkin patch, it is that time of year. If you didn't notice, I got my Halloween Minnie Mouse over here along with a very real pumpkin. This is the one I chose of all the great pumpkins out there. This was the winner. And this next week, I'm going to use this sharp object and create a John O'Lantern well, or Jack O'Lantern, whatever one it is, but it's going to happen. This is my real pumpkin I chose from the pumpkin patch. So if you haven't done so, they got plenty of pumpkin patches, all shapes and sizes, even one starting at a dollar and working our way up from there. So if you want to help out the Community Hope Center, there's no better way to do so than getting yourself a pumpkin outside. And today we have a very special guest joining us from 1230 to 2 p.m., the one and only Amazing Spider-Man. So if you want to join in, Spider-Man's going to be here from 1230 to 2. That's at the pumpkin patch. Operation Christmas Child. I know we shouldn't be talking about Christmas, but this is important. We're trying to reach a goal of 100 shoe boxes. So if you can help out with 100 shoe boxes, maybe not all by yourself, but maybe a couple you could chip in. That's our goal this year, 100 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. So any way you can help out there. And as always, three ways to give. You can go to the website and click the Give button. That's one way. Also, you can text to 8675309. Oh, wait, wrong number. Text to this number right here, a great way to give as well. And also, if you like to do it the old fashioned way, you can put a stamp on it and mail it to this address right here. Any way you give is very much appreciated. We're trying to reach that budget. And if you can help us do so, we greatly appreciate it. So, God bless you all. It's pumpkin time. We'll see you out there with Spider Man, Minnie Mouse, and I'll be out there too. Again, this will be a jack o' lantern next week. So be on the lookout. God bless. Good morning and welcome to church. I invite you to put the events of the week behind you and to prepare your hearts for worship. From the book of Proverbs, listen to the word of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Friends, let us worship God together. Bend me. 
Please pray with us. Dear God, we thank you for blessing us as we grow in your word. We thank you for our parents and the adults in our lives who guide us in so many ways. Please keep our feet on the path you would have us follow. We bring you prayers for healing for those on our prayer list and for all people who are ill. Please be with those who need your help at home, at work, and at school. In this very different year, please be with those who are struggling and bring them your peace and comfort. Please bring healing in all ways to this nation and to the other nations around this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now we will share with you the confession of faith that dates back to the early church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sinneth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Last year as fourth graders, we made a video about having a clear 2020 vision for our church. It has turned out to be a very difficult year. And yet, as we look back this year, we see that. You gave in a season of lack and uncertainty. You invested in God's people and ministry. You cared for the poor. You responded to God's love and call. Now, we are fifth graders. And as we look forward to 2021, we want to hit the reset button and take God's will even further. We know we can do it with your help. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. What's happening? Pastor, I'm out here kayaking. You know, I love to kayak. It's one of my favorite things. It's nice out here in Treasure Island, isn't it? It's beautiful. It really is, man. Well, you know, I was out here putting my sermon together, and it's amazing to bump into you. And, you know, I, well, I don't mind talking to you today because, well, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to church, okay? We're having a little bit of fun. We're out at the beach. We thought we'd change up the scenery and uh, just let you get a look at, you know, just God's creation. And, and I thank you for tuning in today, turning your house into a, a sanctuary, uh, bringing the Lord into your presence, your world, your head, your heart, your relationships, your life. Because when he comes in, he brings all of his goodness. And anything that's broken, he wants to go to work on, whether it's a problem you're dealing with or something inside of you. And so it's just exciting to tune in to, together and seek what God has to say to our personal lives. You know, I got to tell you this crazy story before we jump into the word. Um, you know, I was in the back of the church, and this, this woman, a young woman, with a baby, she's a single woman, she's struggling, and uh, you know, she, she shows up at church, and you know, I give her a big hug when she, when she gets there, and we're chatting, and all of a sudden, she's putting her, the, the carrier down, the baby carrier down, and she's digging around in her purse, and, and, I, and I watch this woman who I know 
is struggling financially, walk over to the donation box and, and drop in. Not just a buck or two. I, I happened to see what she was putting in because I was standing right there. And I, I got to tell you, I was moved to tears that somebody who, who doesn't have much and is struggling to make ends meet and has to take care of a baby all on her own still prioritized the ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't mind telling you. I said, I cried. I did. I, I choked up because it just pointed out to me what it means to be devoted to and pursue and honor the Lord. And so, you know, if this is somebody who's struggling, I know, let's step up our end and, and make sure that we also prioritize the ministry of Jesus Christ, okay? Well, I'm excited about our word today. We've been going through some different topics and, and trying to go over some of the main themes of Christianity. And, and today we're going to talk about the main theme, love. And, and love, you know, it's pretty much the driving force, the driving priority of our entire lives. You know, if you think about it, for centuries, millennia, people have been looking for love. And, and to borrow a line from the old country western song, they've been looking for love in all the wrong places. And, and so where do you find out? you know, the definition of love. Well, I know that you can't go to society because look at our society right now. It's full of hate and brokenness and division. If you're on the other side of the political argument, wow, you know, it's just not a good place to be. And then, of course, you can't sadly go to religion where you would think it would be the definition clearly stated because too many churches have misinterpreted Love, not as a relationship, but as rules and regulations. You know, obviously, I don't know that we can be tuning in to Hollywood because they've misrepresented love. I mean, let's be honest, friends. Um, <laughs> there's this one uh, love story, and love story, and it says, love means never having to say you're sorry. Now, I don't know what kind of relationship they're in, but I'm constantly in need of receiving and extending forgiveness in my relationships. So I, I don't know that they get it right. And, and, you know, we're in the town that Disney built, and <laughs> it's kind of funny because, you know, the little girls and boys, they get their princess and princess, princess and princess outfits, and they're all excited about, you know, uh, being that character. And the little girl wants to be Snow White who grows up to marry Prince Charming and finds out she actually dentally married Grumpy. Okay? And, you know, we say to our spouses, Oh, you know, I love my spouse. And I love pepperoni pizza. And the fact of the matter is both of them give you heartburn, but it's not the same, okay? You've got uh, two different elements going on here. And so what do we know to be the right words? Well, we know that we can use the word incorrectly to manipulate people. I'm thinking of Betty who sent Ben a letter. I'll read it to you. Dear Ben, no words can express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Oh, you know, I... I, 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 I want you to take me back because nobody will ever be able to take your place in my heart. Please forgive me. I love you. Betty. Oh, by the way, congratulations on winning the lottery. Okay. Yeah, she doesn't love him. She wants the money. You know, this one man was trying to figure out how to tell his girl that he loved her. And so he went into the Webster's Dictionary. And he read to her not just the trite statement, I love you, but the deeper meaning. He looked her in the eyes and says, I have a tender and passionate affection for you as a member of the opposite sex. <laughs> and you know, that might be the adequate way of ex stating what love is, but somehow it gets lost in the communication. Yeah, and this is romantic love, okay? Uh, there's, the, there's our friendship love. You know, I said to my best friend the other day, Dr. O'Leary, I said, hey man, I love you. Uh, not in any inappropriate way. And he said, I'm glad you clarified, okay? You know, we got friendship love. We got romantic love. We got the love for our family. But, but, but we need something solid that helps us understand where, what love is. And, and, and so where do we go to find it out? 
I'm going to say we go to the source of love, God, the Father. Okay, he's the one who created us. He's the one who placed himself, his own DNA, part of it inside of us, that entails the desire for love. Okay, this is important that you hear this. See, love is where we derive life's meaning. You know, God is love. That's what it says in the Bible. And therefore, he defines love, he demonstrates love, he commands us to love. And it all starts with our need for love. You know, we were made to be in an intimate relationship, a love relationship with God. But we messed it up, we mismanaged our free will in the Garden of Eden. Uh, rather than uh, <clears throat> wanting to be the recipient of God's love, we wanted to have our own independence, and so, you know, we messed up the entire relationship. And then rather than being done with us, God does something amazing, okay? His love is such that he went and pursued us. He personally went to retrieve us and invite us back into the relationship that we messed up. And I want you to think about this with me. The majestic creator, almighty God, this incomprehensible, intimidating, all-powerful being, this one made a personal sacrifice to woo us back into a relationship with him. And let me put this into perspective. <clears throat> Have you ever gone shopping for a car and you haven't been able to afford the new car, so you go to the old car lots? Well, so I'm looking for a used car and I find this one that looks brand new. In fact, it only has 3,000 miles on it and, and it's going for a cheap price. And so I say to the salesman, what's the deal with this, this inexpensive price on this amazing car? He goes, well, it got returned under the lemon law. And you know what that is. You buy a new car, it's not working, it's a lemon, and so, you know, Chrysler had to buy it back. Well, I wasn't interested. I didn't need to take it for a test drive. I didn't need to negotiate. I didn't want to even invest any energy into this potential car because, you know what, I have enough lemons in my life. The last thing I need to do is add a lemon car. I mean, it actually says on the windshield, it's a lemon, you know. You got to know, don't do it. But here's what's so amazing about God's love. He bought us through Jesus Christ's cross back from sin when we were lemons. In fact, he paid top dollar for an as-is lemon. I mean, nobody pays full price for a lemon, but that's exactly what God did for you and me, okay? He knew we were rotten, and yes, he gave the price of his son. Friends, I want you to think about this. This is outrageous love. It's not natural to love somebody who doesn't love you. It's not natural to give your best when less is acceptable. It's not natural to give everything when there's absolutely no guarantee that you're going to receive anything in return. But this is the love that God has for you, the investment that he made to bring you back under his care, his covering, and an eternal life with you, his creation. And friends, it doesn't even stop at the cross. He then gives us his Holy Spirit. And this is amazing. This is the presence of God with us at all time to comfort us when we're hurting, to guide us when we're making decisions, to bring to remembrance the promises and the hope and the future that he has planned for us. And it's an eternal insurance plan. We get to go to heaven because of what Jesus did. And best of all, it's a present friendship with the living God. Yeah, we're not doing religion here. We're entering into a relationship with somebody who's mighty crazy about you. You know, I think people's deepest need and drive that we have as humans is to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. And unconditionally, not based on my performance, not based on how gifted I am, if I met the standards, no. This is me as is. And we're hoping that somebody would come along and say, I'll take you. And friends, this is how God feels about you. <coughs> you know, in Isaiah 43, this is what it says. 
God says this to his people. You are precious and honored, and I love you. And friends, you know who that you is? I'm talking to you. This is how he feels about you. He ransomed us through Jesus Christ, his son. This is the love of God. You know, this one woman, she inherited a family heirloom. It was a vase that had been passed down through the generations. It's hundreds of years old. And so it's now in her possession. And, well, you know, she tells her little girl, listen, stay out of the living room and stay away from that table that has that vase on it. Do not play in this room. Well, you know, little girls, they get running around the house and they play wherever they can. And sure enough, she's playing in the wrong room. She's playing next to the table. She bumps the table. The vase falls over. This generational treasure, this hundreds-year-old priceless piece shatters on the ground. And she knows she's in trouble. The shattering scared her. She immediately starts crying. Mom comes running into the room. She surveys the situation. Then she scoops up her daughter walks her out of the room and starts to console her. Later on in life, the woman says, that day I realized that I was the family treasure. Friends, I'm telling you this because what God has done through his son, the investment he's made by putting his spirit into you, the eternal heaven that he has ready for us, you are his treasure. And he's inviting you into a relationship with him. It's not based on what you do. It's based on what he's done for you. He's just saying, what more could I do? Let's do life together. I love you. Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, there's only one adequate response to such love. And it's our passage. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words... There's no one, there's nothing, there's no hobby, there's no pursuit that should get in the way of your devotion to our Lord. You know, the Westminster Catechism for question number one is, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to love him forever. Friends, this is what it means to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To get up in the morning and go, Lord, how can I bring you glory? Well, God's nature is love. The dynamic between us and God is love. And guess what? He wants us to love one another. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is John 13, 34. Hey, love, it's the greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says in Mark 12, 30 and 31, there is no other commandment greater than this. And, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting because Jesus places commandment one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know why he puts one and two together? Because the same way that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is how he wants us to love one another with an investment of everything we are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. You might say that love is the great authenticator, okay? When you and I love somebody, this authenticates the message of Jesus Christ. When you let Jesus redirect your attitude so, towards somebody, when you decide to forgive somebody, when you get inconvenienced to bless somebody, when you care about somebody who doesn't care about you, you're showing the world that Christianity is the real deal. You know, in fact, Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. And, and to be honest, there's a lot of knockoffs in our world today. You know, in the marketplace, there's these cut-rate manufacturers who make a living replicating original product lines, and they'll even duplicate the logo, okay? And they attempt to make it look just like the original. And, and you see this especially in ladies' purses, the Gucci purses, you know, those radically expensive things. 
Okay. Well, they're not the real deal. In fact, this one pastor was saying he's in Seoul, Korea, and, and he's going shopping, and they offer the knockoff with the original tag that you can iron on so nobody will know that you paid less for the real deal. And Paul addresses this authentication issue in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. You know, he says something radical. He says, you know, if I speak in the tongues of angels, if I have all knowledge, all prophetic powers, he says, if I have the faith to move mountains, if I get martyred and my body burned to honor Jesus Christ, and I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Isn't that incredible? You know, love, it's the essential thing. You know, when Paul has a list of the virtues of the faith, this is what he says, the greatest of these is love. And, and, you know, when you look it up in the dictionary, this is what it means to be essential. It's constituting the essence of something. It's the utmost importance. It's basic to what it is. It's indispensable. It's an absolute necessity and requirement. And guess what that is for the Christian? That we love, okay? This is what separates the knockoffs from the real things. This is what God's looking for us, from us. And this is what the world is looking for from us. Love. You know, you might say love is the great apologetic. And the apologetic means that it's the proof of, of the situation. It means we can defend real Christianity when you and I love. And, and you know, there's this passage in 1 Corinthians. I got to read it to you. This is how Paul defines love. It's patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is the kind of love that, that's not supposed to be only read at weddings. This is the kind of love that you and I are to apply to everybody. And it's a great test. How are you doing with loving other people? You know, somebody once said, okay, this is what you got to do. You got to put your name in place of love and read this passage. And so I tried it. William is patient and kind. Uh, William does not envy or boast. William is not arrogant or rude. William does not insist on his own way. William is not irritable or resentful. William doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. William rejoices with the truth. William bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. William never fails. And I get done reading it and I go, who's William? Because <laughs> it isn't this guy. I'm trying to be this way. But friends, you know what? When you keep practicing something, you know, I was talking with the pastor this week and this is what he said. Because these two police officers, they would practice disarming somebody with a gun. And so they would disarm the person, then hand the gun back to him. Disarm the person and hand the gun back to him. Disarm the person and hand the gun back to him. And they practice this. Well, these guys are at a convenience store and there's a robber with a gun and the off-duty policeman disarms them and then hands the gun back to the robber. Why? Because this is what he practiced. It became second nature. And friends, when you and I are practicing and trying our best to apply love to our lives, it's going to become the way we handle the people around us, the situations that we're confronted with. You know, James 2, it has a verse that's really a kick in the shins for all of us Christians. It says, if you see somebody in need and you merely speak spiritual words like, I'll pray for you, and you don't do something about their needs... Your faith is dead. You go, yikes. That's kind of intense. I don't want to have a dead faith. So here's the deal. Sorry, I'm enjoying the sun here, guys. Love is an action word. When Jesus commands us to love one another, he doesn't tell us to feel a bit. No, he tells us to do it. In fact, in Colossians 3.14, we're to put on love. 
And, and to put on, it's the meaning of getting dressed. You know, when you and I get up in the morning, we consciously decide what we're going to wear. We don't, you know, fall into the closet and come out all dressed. I mean, I know some people look like that's what happened when they get up in the morning. But no, we decide what we're going to put on. And you and I have to decide as we go out that we're going to love people. And, and, you know, love, it's an emotion, but it's more than emotion, okay? It's a force that we decide to activate because we're Christians that belong to the God of love. You know, over the years, I've had different ministries. It, you know, I was a hospital chaplain. I was a police chaplain. I was a prison chaplain. You know, I worked at a mental institution as, you know, an a, a advocate for the teenagers. Um, I was a homeless advocate. But, you know, of all the things that I did, addiction counseling was probably the hardest one. I mean, you're dealing with folks who are going through withdrawals. You're dealing with people that have already spent everything they've had, stolen the family money in order to, to, to you know, keep their addiction going. And so they're always trying to manipulate you to get the, you know, substitute for the narcotic that, that they're trying to get off of. And, you know, these people would be so mean. They would be abusive. I had people spit in my face. I had people threaten to kill me and my family. You know, and, and, and I got to be honest, some of these people were miserable, and I didn't like them one bit. I had no positive feelings of love towards them whatsoever. But here's the deal. I wanted the best for them. I, I wanted them to overcome this addiction. I was rooting for them, and I would put up with their attitudes and their bad behavior in hopes that one day they would heal and grow and become whole. And friends, sometimes you're not gonna like the people God wants you to love. But guess what? He's called you to represent Him and love them anyways. You know, right now, <clears throat> we have a, a team at our church. Tracy Mattis is creating this ministry for children called the Church Dog. In fact, um, we want people to see Jesus and, 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 and kind of become a new, a new way for, for kids to, to find Jesus. And so uh, this is the book that she's written, and we have a whole bunch of books coming, and it's coming right out of our church. It, it's really an exciting ministry. And, and, and so we want the next generation to meet Jesus, and it's coming through a puppy that <clears throat> happens to be from one of my litters. Okay, and it's a dog that comes to church regularly. I, I know it's crazy. We live in a world now where people bring their dogs to church, you know, and, and, and that's okay with me. So check this out, okay? We're getting ready to, to launch this exciting, you know, new book. It's going to be happening, actually, in our pumpkin patch November 1st. So we want you all to participate. We're going to have all kinds of treats and everything, and you're going to be able to meet, you know, the real church dog. And so we're promoting this on one of the, the uh, social media outlets. And, and, you know, we have this really cool line from the book, and this is what it says. It says, imagine how different the world would be if only people could see themselves and others through the eyes of Jesus. This is the heart of the message and the intention of Church Dog. Well, what a nice message, right? And not so much. Okay, all of a sudden, people start complaining. Why is Christian content on this community site? You know, the founding principles of this town don't have religion. And I go, actually, if you look at the original version of celebration, a church was established in the center of town. So you're actually wrong when you make that statement. Another person asked, are you implying that those who do not believe in Jesus make the world a lesser place? Another person mocked us, saying, Imagine how wonderful the world would be if everyone read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, <laughs> a book that says belief in God is not only wrong but potentially dangerous. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, in the last century, three different atheist regimes killed 135 million people, and Christians are the dangerous ones. All of this controversy over this cute little puppy. Well, 
Of course, we didn't answer the atheist, you know, with an antagonizing response. But, you know, yes, I am saying that the love of Jesus Christ, if carried out the way the Bible defines it, as we totally invest in the well-being of the people around us, if we lived that way, friends, the world would be a better place. You know, today we're pushing humanism. And humanism is a, is a great idea that, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, treat one another well. But what folks don't take into account is human nature. See, Jesus addresses a broken human nature. Humanism doesn't. And what's going to happen naturally is the sinful nature is going to arise. And those in power will then subjugate, control, and profit off of those they rule. It's just the way sinful nature works in people's lives. And that's why Jesus came, not so that we'll be good people, but so that we'll be God people. The God of love people is who we're supposed to be. And another argument that was raised online, I want you to listen to this. You know, this is in response to the little church dog. Why do you so-called church-going, self-proclaimed good Christians hate the LGBTQ community and Muslims and Chinese and Mexicans? I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm thinking when Pulse happened, we put a service together to, to you know, uh, give families that were connected to those, those poor victims a place to, to grieve and find hope. I mean, I got a couple of Hispanics on my, my you know, team right now. Uh, we don't hate any of these people. But you know what? I felt like this is what's going on. This is how the woman says it, and I need you to hear this, Christian. I'm talking to you right now. She said, I'm genuinely not sure how believing in Jesus makes a difference for them, us Christians. Ouch. I want you to hear me. The atheist is throwing down a challenge. I'm not seeing the love that Christians are reputed to have in the Christians around me. And friends, I just got to say, you know, we can have arguments about free will. We can have arguments about the sinful nature. We can have answers to all the objections. But the greatest tool that we have in showing the world our faith is to love them the way Jesus Christ loves us. You know, <clears throat> I remember one time I was at a homeless place and I was a young man and I was, you know, trying to s serve food. And, you know, I said to the guy that was running the show, hey, uh, you know, are we serving Christians? Because it was happening out of a church. And he said, I hope not. I hope we're serving non-Christians so that they can meet our love, our Lord through our love. And isn't that the great challenge of Matthew 25? Jesus says, come, inherit the kingdom of God that was prepared before you, for you, before the, the foundation of the world. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. And they said, Lord, well, when did we see you this way? Whenever you saw somebody in need, you were taking care of me. And you know what, friends? What this means is it's kind of fun. These people weren't even thinking about it. You know what happened? They changed out the selfish nature for the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit is influencing the way they deal with the people around them, the way they care for the people who have needs, the way they forgive folks who are still struggling, the way well, they love others the way God has loved us. And I guess I have to ask, are you still operating under the old nature? Or is the Holy Spirit guiding your path? You know, I'm going to close up here. During my psychology degree, we had to answer the question, if you were shipwrecked and floating on an ocean with your friend in a rubber raft, and all you had was five gallons of water, a set of flares, and enough food for one week. What item would you throw over if you had to because, well, you had to throw one item over in order to make it to land? Which one would you discard? 
Apparently, I answered incorrectly. I said my friend. <laughs> and, and if that would be your answer, friends, this sermon is for us. Because you have to know the Christian priority is he wants us to care about others more than ourselves. And here's what I want you to know. Christian, our love is other-centered. And it's only successful when you and I are God-centered. Well, this is the greatest priority. And I have to ask a question right now. Christian, are you handing your life over so that Jesus is guiding your path? And maybe you're watching this and you're going, you know, I've been troubled by some of the Christians around me and, and that we're all still in process. We're all still trying to get it right. And the more we cling to the Lord, the more we pursue him, the more we let his spirit inside, the more we get transformed. And it's a beautiful relationship that I was telling you about earlier with God. And, and maybe you haven't entered into that relationship yet. Friends, it's not based on how good you are. It's based on how good he is. And he loves you. And he would love for you to step into this relationship. All you have to say is, Lord, I'm flawed. I'm one of those sinners who needs to be forgiven. And he brings that forgiveness to you. He wraps his arms around you. And he brings you into this this life that's called abundant and eternal life. It's life with God. So wherever you are on the journey, let's take a step in that direction. Friends, God loves you. And I'd like to say this. He really loves you. Let's love him back. Amen. Have a God week.
Hey friends, if you were watching today and you know what, you feel inspired, you know, our church is really making a difference in, in people's lives. We're, we're really doing our best to strategize on how to bring people to know Jesus Christ. And, and you know, we could use some help right now. We're not making it with the budget. Um, I told you about the person who barely has anything and is making a commitment. And, you know, she believes in the mission of, of our church. She believes in the love that God has for us. She believes in the need for us to love others. And, and I know that's how you feel or you wouldn't be tuned in. So if you'd be willing to help us out, um, we're struggling, we need it. More importantly, there's all kinds of people struggling around us and we want to meet their needs. So let's unite and, and do this together. Love you, amen. In today's fast moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.